Good evening, everybody. My name is Paul Koch. I'm the chair of the North Andover Zoning Board, and we will make a handful of announcements while we open every meeting by rising and recite the Pledge of Allegiance. So could we all do that? <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So thank you all for that. This is going to be an extraordinarily challenging meeting, I think, for everyone, both the folks who are participating, you know, as applicants for certainly for the board members, for the administrators, for NACAM, for the public who is interested in commenting. This is an extraordinarily unsatisfactory arrangement. It is, however, the arrangement that we have in order to continue with, with business while we are in the midst of COVID-19, the shutdowns and all that kind of um regime um I, I would like to say just a just a few things one is to thank NACAM, to thank the folks at it to thank jennifer battersby our administrator for their work in setting this up every I, for to all of you i apologize that everybody is going to think this is unsatisfactory but i absolutely appreciate that you have gotten us this far and are giving everybody the opportunity to advance these matters in a public forum a public setting uh, the next thing I'd like to say is just in case we have some people on the line uh, on telephones, and it's probably wise just to advise everybody, although you know that this is something that is being recorded for posterity. So you are on a telecommunications line and you are being recorded. If anybody objects to that, then this is your opportunity to hang up now because this is a public meeting that will be a public record and recorded. Second thing is we're not going to have a lot of visual here. I think we've got a graphic up on NACAM that articulates names and articulates a uh, Jennifer Battersby. She is the zoning administrator with her email address. Folks who are listening to this or are watching this uh, are welcome to email Jen any questions, comments, opinions, things that are of a quality that can be read into the record. When we get into the public comment element of any of the hearings, I will kind of throw the ball to Jen, ask her if she has any questions, comments from the public. She will read them and then the board will respond or uh, delegate them off to the applicant for responses. Next thing on the list uh, is Alan Kusha, board member, uh, is not in attendance tonight. He has made arrangements. Every, everything about that is fine. That is an unexcused absence to borrow the phrase of former chair. Um, Another item, a logistical thing, is to the extent that folks can put their phones or their microphones, uh, the, the, the closer your mouths are to the microphone, the clearer the communication will be. I am sure we are going to have hiccups throughout the night as we're going to be saying, hey, could you repeat that, please? I didn't quite catch that. I am not going to have any shame in asking folks to repeat things because I want the entirety of the meeting attendees and or observers to get as clear a communication as we can. Uh, furthermore, since Alan is not in attendance, he is the clerk, uh, Madam Vice Chair, Ellen McIntyre is going to be uh, reading the notices and making the motions, <clears throat> generally making the motions. Uh, so with that, I think the next thing on the agenda, just to kind of get things rolling, uh, is the acceptance of the minutes of March 10th. That being the case, I think there were only four folks at the meeting on March 10th, uh, Paul, Ellen, Michael, and Stephen. I think all of us are on the line, so therefore, could there be a motion? So moved, I'll make a motion to accept the, meet, uh, the meeting minutes from the March 10th meeting as written. Ms. McIntyre makes the Ms. McIntyre makes the motion, and who seconded? Mike Liss. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Motion made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 So I, I I think I heard I think I heard a unanimous vote unless there is a comment. Paul, this is Ellen speaking. I think we want to just um, are we going to do a roll call thing? Because I mean, I have on my screen is phone numbers, so I don't have names. So I think it might be um, uh, I'm not sure how to approach it. So Jennifer knows for meeting minutes. That is, that is a fair point, Ms. McIntyre. Therefore, I will indeed call the roll. Thank you for the suggestion. Uh, so, uh, Stephen. 
Steve on the line? No, Steve. All right, well, why don't we table aside. Steve checked in earlier. I suspect that he will be returning. Uh, so perhaps we will <clears throat> table this for the time being and come back to the acceptance of the minutes of March 10th. Did you also want to do a little bit of a roll call on who is that? Uh, Alan, so Alan's the only one not here, correct? Is that, and then everyone else on the board is here. Thank you for the prompt. That is another another fair point from the uh, 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 from Madam Vice Chair. So I will just go down the list on the masthead. Uh, Paul Koch, I am here. Ellen McIntyre. I am here, present. Alan Kusha is absent. Uh, Ms. Jacobs. Here. Mr. Fagan. I am here. Mr. List. Here. Mr. Seide. Waiting on him. I'm sure he'll return. And Mr. Killalay. Yes. And I think we also have, if you could confirm, Jennifer Battersby, you are the uh, zoning administrator. You are present, yes? Yes, present. And do we have Mr. Hudgens on the line? I am here. Brilliant. Is there anybody whose name I did not call on the line? Well, I think Mr. Foley's on the line, but is there hey, anybody Paul, else from the town on the line? Paul? Yes, sir. This is Steve. Can you hear me? Brilliant. Thank you, Steve. Okay. Now, I'm sorry. I was there all along. I did not. I was using the mute on my phone. I didn't do the star six, so I'm sorry. I was there. I was muted. I'm back. Sorry about that. No problem. Thank, thank you for uh, for fixing that part. So we have a roll of all the members aside for Mr. Kusha. So why don't we repeat the Ms. McIntyre has made a motion to accept the minutes of March 10th. Mr. List has seconded the motion. Uh, there are a few eyes in front of you. Steve, do you? Uh, yes, uh, I. Yes. Brilliant. So that is unanimous. We are rolling down the agenda. Thank you all. Um, and since since we have no visuals, perhaps I will just make uh, make the auditory ones. Ordinarily, I would look up and down the table to see if anybody has a comment or a question at this point. Is there anybody on the line that has a comment or a question? Seeing and hearing none, we will move on to item number three on the agenda, which is the continued public hearing of 210 Holt Road. And if, if we, I think the applicant is on the line, could you kindly uh, sound off as to who is here on behalf of the applicant? Hi, Mr. Chairman, this is Kevin Foley. Can you hear me? I can. Thank you very much, Kevin. Mr. Any, Chairman, anybody members else? of the board, I, I, I have, uh, I'm Kevin Foley. I'm a 32-year resident of North Andover Law Practice in Newburyport. I represent the petitioner MMD shooting and the applicant, Jennifer Tomp. She's also online with us. This is a continued Thank hearing in our application for a special permit for a recreational use of a shooting range in an industrial zone. The last time that we were together was March 10th, 2020. And at that time we continued until April 14, 2020, but of course the coronavirus emergency struck us and our entire world changed. And we continued until this date. I hope all is well with you, Mr. Chairman and the members and all your families. Uh, the last time that we were together, um, I had uh, reviewed some supplemental restate of narrative, revised plans and sketches and information regarding the board's questions about noise, air quality, structural integrity, safety, governance, operations of the proposed, um, of the proposed um, facility. I provide information about the applicant, Jennifer Thompson, who's a 14 year North Andover resident. She's married to Jeff Thompson. They have two school age children. Uh, Jennifer has an MBA from Regis. She grew up around firearms. Um, she wants to create a facility that's, um, that's a, a state of the art facility with live shooting, air guns, virtual training. She has her license to carry and her FFL. And uh, she feels that education in, is an integral and uh, central component for the safe and proper use of firearms with her application. Um, I also uh, had our architect take you through some of the sketches regarding the construction of the walls, the ceilings, the HVAC system. Our architectural engineer with 40 years experience provided an analysis of the sound suppression within the facility and outside the facility. Um, he came to the conclusion that nobody outside the facility 
would hear live shooting. Um, he did a, you may remember, he did a little study of the adjacent property at Princeton Properties, which is about 1,900 feet uh, from this facility, this proposed facility, uh, and, um, and used that figure, uh, even though it's only uh, 15, he, he used 1,500 feet, even though it's 1,900 feet away. He came to the conclusion that only 23 decibels would be there, but you'd have to subtract four dBs from that because of absorption, leaving it at 19 dB, virtually no chance of hearing anything from those new condos at Princeton Place. In fact, the outside rear wall of the facility would have 79 dB. Um, Mr. Cromar gave the analysis that 75 dB is what you would normally hear in a, in a crowded restaurant. The property line would be 48 dB. So that was the analysis you heard on sound. I reviewed the licensing requirements for the operation and the retail and the oversight under uh, state law chapter 140, where all the authority rests with the chief of police in North Andover. I also introduced the board to Jerry Gallo, who uh, is joined us as a consultant in our, in our quest for a special permit and our license before the chief of police. He's 34 year veteran of the alcohol, tobacco and firearms and he's done training for the state police and the Homeland Security in safe and proper uh, use of uh, firearms. Um, we submitted uh, the application to the chief of police for our license on March the 6th. Uh, we had already done that before we appeared with you last, Mr. Chairman. On March the 12th, I provided an email to the ZBA and the planning board because you may recall that the last time we met, the architect had handed out kind of a, a large packet of information from Fort One Architects it turns out that only six of those pages and six sketches were really considered new information, and, but really um, they were used as um, shock by the architect and the noise consultant to explain the uh, specifications regarding the construction and the noise suppression. Uh, I included that information again in your packet uh, for tonight. Also on, on March the 16th, at the request of the planning board, uh, I submitted to the chief of police and to the North Andover chief fire chief, everything that we had submitted to the ZBA and to the planning board in support of our application for a special permit. On March the 18th, the chief of police sent a, a email uh, to the planning board with a favorable opinion of the plan. And you have a copy of that email in your package this evening. Um, on April the 14th, we appeared before the planning board again, and we're continued until July. They, they had requested that we provide revised plans showing all the parking spaces available on the site in the size of the spaces. And they also requested that we do a Title V. And with everything going on with COVID, you know, that's, that's in the works. We did on May the 6th submit revised plans to both the ZBA and planning, full-size plans. I, and I, I spoke with the building inspector he has the full size plans and we provided copies to each of the members. And I also provided that again last week in an email to Jennifer. So that, that's where we stand at, at this point. I, I don't know if uh, the, the board has any further questions about where we're going or whether the public might have questions about what we're proposing to do up at 210 Holt Road. Thank you very much for that uh, overview, um, Mr. Foley. The one the thing that I had thought of to do prior uh, to the meeting is to actually articulate the uh, the email from the chief in order to get it into the record and to a wider audience, uh, ensuring that everybody gets uh, you know both the statement and the nuance of of his statement. Since this is something that the board, speaking for this board anyway, the zoning board, uh, has been looking for an opinion from the uh, the North Andover Police Department, uh, largely from the outset. So I'm I'm grateful that this actually came through. The email reads. Uh, from uh, Chief Charles Gray to Jean Enright. She's the town planner. Uh, good afternoon. I have reviewed the plan submitted to me by attorney Kevin Foley on behalf of MMD Shooting LLC, 210 Holt Road. I have a limited knowledge of constructing shooting ranges, but as a police officer, I have been to many ranges and gun shops. Having that in mind at this time, I have a favorable opinion on the plan. It would appear that the layout and safety features are consistent with other ranges that I have seen and used. Thank you, Charles P. Gray, Chief of Police. So with that, with that text uh, in, into the, the record, both orally and uh, in its written form, uh, again, thank you for getting that. I just wanna point out that the, the Chief, 
uh, you know, to his credit, is opining on the facility. The chief is not necessarily opining on the uh, operator, uh, and, and he is not uh, the guy to do that at this point anyway, because he is going to be going through a licensing or permitting process on his own. So he would be uh, hard pressed to offer an opinion on the business itself. He is only offering an opinion, uh, a favorable opinion, mind you, on the plans for the business, the the, uh, the you know the structure the structure uh, of the business. So with with that, I will kind of look up and down the the table here and ask: Are there any board members uh, who have a question, comment, concern? While we do that, however, I would ask if we could anybody who is not speaking. It makes things harder in the exchanges. But if we're not speaking, could we kindly mute the phones because we do get a reverb uh, if we've got too many people uh, uh, listening and not speaking. So with that, again, looking up and down the line, uh, don't have to all rush at once. Who's got something on their mind? Yes, so this is Mike Liss. Um, Mr. Foley, uh, is it still the intention of the applicant to, to have 24-hour access for members? Yes, that's, yes, yes, that's, member list, that's correct. Is there anyone else with a, yeah. a follow-up question to that or another, another another matter entirely? Help yourself. Yeah, uh, Paul, this is uh, Steve, Steve Seides. Uh, so, uh, Kevin, the I've always been impressed with the construction associated with the facility. So, I, I agree. State of, it certainly appears state-of-the-art. And the chief's comments are structurally construction related okay now as a as a non uh shooter myself uh, and so you know full disclosure a naivety to the guns i what i i to me i'm not concerned about the construction of the site what i'm concerned about continue to be concerned about is the overall safety to our town now i don't know what i don't know but in the uh, in the material that I'm looking at, it's all construction related. So there, uh, perhaps it's there somewhere, and you can just make it clear to me. But how can I respond to a fellow citizen of mine in, in North Andover about no need to be concerned? Here's the safety that this facility has. So could you please help me with that? Member Sadie, uh, the uh, in terms of the operation of the facility and the uh, ensuring that there's safe operation, that squarely fits in the province of the chief of police under uh, general laws. I think we did provide a presentation on March the 10th with a flow chart with regard to uh, people entering the facility who are members and those who are non-members and what they would have to go through in terms of security and checkpoints. So you may remember the flow charts that I went over on the 10th, like all that is going to have to be presented to the chief again to make sure that meets his specifications for how this ought to operate. So it's really in his province under under uh, Chapter 140 uh, to make sure the operation is run safely. So I guess to answer your question, I, I would answer anybody who asks you about it and say that's that's up to the chief of police to make sure this place is operating as it's supposed to and in, within the guidelines. Any sort of uh, tactical issue, if, as I mentioned the last time, if we had any sort of a problem up there, the chief has sole discretion to uh, suspend and revoke our license. So um, I think it's, a, it's really an ideal setup in terms of that oversight, because as you know, the police station is just a quarter of a mile down the road from the facility. And as I mentioned last time, we're anticipating a very close relationship with not only the North, North Andover Police Department, but with surrounding police departments in the county in terms of uh, working with their law enforcement officers to make sure they're properly trained. And th that's part of the reason why we're doing, going to do these virtual ranges upstairs to put them in a whole variety of situations that they wouldn't normally get uh, elsewhere. So um, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, thank you. And I, uh, I'm going to ask my peers, so is our role with 
uh, this special permit, one of construction or one of safety or both? With an application that is before us, Steve, uh, and kind of anything and everything is under uh, our province. So it's the, the, board, the board's discretion to determine kind of how wide, uh, how the breadth of material that it wants to undertake in order to make a decision. Okay, thank you. Uh, Attorney Foley, this is Alan speaking. Um, did you actually say you needed to do a, a what are you doing environmentally there in the, in the, um, on the site? Can you hear me okay, Member McIntyre? Yep. Uh, the, um, the last time we appeared before the um, planning board in April, uh, they had requested, they had run this through the uh, different departments and the health administrator, the board of health administrator had asked that we do um, a, what they call a title five on the, uh, the, 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 uh, the facility is, is uh, served by a septic system. Okay. So you do a Title V to make sure that's going to meet the uh, specifications with the uh, with the new use. So that's that's in process right now. I didn't realize it was septic. I'm sorry again. This is Ellen speaking. I didn't realize it was septic down there. I thought it was a uh, um, public sewage. Now I, I suspect that when when they finally uh, run the sewer down past. Uh, <laughs> When they run the sewer down past uh, when um, when we have yeah when we have 1600 when that new sewer project goes then maybe Holt Road will get tied in it is tied into town water but not town sewer so uh, a, a septic system serves the facility currently. So this is this is Ron Fagan speaking um, and I start this with apologies. If this has been covered before this meeting, I watched you know December, January, and March, and it gets a little confusing to me which one was which. So, just a couple of questions. I understand from comments earlier is 24 hours of operation. What time is it not attended? Has that been established? Member Fagan, we're anticipating our our operational hours will be where it's going to be attended from. Uh, uh, 10 o'clock until 8 p.m. at night. Okay, thank you. And from 8 p.m. at night until 10 in the morning, members will have access, if I understood what I read correctly, both with a key fob and a, some sort of biometric? That's correct. What is the biometric? I believe that's going to be a thumbprint. All right. And if a member has access to this at two in the morning and brings in a non-member tailing behind them, you know, tailgating, what happens? Uh, it's actually gonna be allowable for them to bring in one single guest, but they have to register that guest in writing. So this will be confirmed via a, uh, a, a video log of some sort, as well as the, the record of them signing somebody in to confirm that they that's, match? That, that's correct. Okay. If they bring in, identify, they'll have to identify the guest in, in writing. All right. So they don't know. You don't know whether that guest has ever had any sort of firearms training. No, that member will be responsible. That member will be a licensed uh, to carry member, and they'll be responsible for any guests they bring into the facility. Is that common on ranges? I've only been in a couple of ranges in my life, so. Uh, like everybody else on this board, I confess to being woefully ignorant of how this whole thing works. Is that common I, that um, non-residents, non-members with no training have the ability to come in at off hours and shoot when the facility is unattended? Well, as long as they're supervised by a member, to answer your question, I, I have limited experience in, in dealing with, uh, you know, going to ranges myself personally, but uh, we hired uh, Jerry Gallo and, of course, uh, Jennifer Thompson has a license to carry in her FFL and has been to ranges her entire life as well as her husband. And that, that's a common, it's very common for these ranges to be open 24 hours a day and for allowing a member to bring a single guest with them after hours. All right. And there was discussion about 
um, it's this being available to law enforcement, you know, and particularly it was of interest, you know, from the 10 p.m. to 8 a.m. shift for those members of law enforcement who do not work during a normal first shift. Are law enforcement, do they need to be members to gain access? Yes, they would need to be a member. Okay, so whether they're law enforcement from North Andover, Andover, Haverhill, Lawrence, as long as they're members oh, and they're law enforcement, they have access. That's correct, Member Fagan. Okay, thank you very much. This is Alexandria, and I might have missed it. What are the membership requirements? Like, if I want to become a member, what do I have to do? You, 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 you must have a license to carry to start with, and then you'll be required to complete an application. Okay, and when my license to carry expires, are you guys keeping, are, are they going to keep track of that? Oh, yeah. In fact, uh, you, you may have heard my comment that I think that periodically we're going to supply information to the police department who will QC us. And if we find anybody is telling us the license to carry is okay and it's not, um, they're going to lose all privilege to ever return to the facility. Okay, so they do have to have an active license at the time of their membership. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Hey, is that a is that a minimum requirement to have a license to carry, or are you going to pile on? Is there an expectation of adding on other conditions to membership? The license license to carry will be the minimum. And are we concepting any uh, greater? filtration systems or just, you know, if you've got a license to carry a signature and a credit card, uh, you're in. Yeah, as long as you, pack, as long as you pass a background check you have, to, to get the license to carry, you should be okay. So there will not be a, a background check independent of the license to carry? No, the license to carry carries with it a background check in terms of and convictions how and all how, how often does the, the LTC, uh, I don't know, what, uh, turn over? Or how, what's the ex expiration date on those kind of things? A year or two? They, they, they're good for five years. And is there a background check on that, on that fifth year in order to renew? Yes, there is. So the, uh, the, obviously where I'm headed is, so in between that first day of your LTC, and the end of the fifth year, we have no idea what's going on with that individual. The, the club, the club will not be doing an independent background check in order to discover if they've had a, I don't know, something untoward on their record in the interim. Okay, it was, it was my, I, I didn't phrase that in the form of a question, I apologize. So the club will not be doing an interim background check and we'll just be ex expecting that a, a four year and 364 day old LTC uh, with its four year, 364 day old background check will satisfy. I'm being that told that what's, what, what's contemplated there is that they will present that license to carry each year because the, um, the membership is going to be a year-to-year -year membership, so it's not going to be okay, a five-year so, membership. Okay, and as long as the LTC has not 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 been pulled, then uh, you know that that part of the application renewal passes. Yeah, that's correct. What would what would an individual with an LTC have to do in order to have it revoked? Well, I, I tell you, in Massachusetts, you can have your license to carry revoked for getting into an argument at town hall under the case law and have it upheld in district court. And I know that because I've um, I successfully got those things reinstated and I've lost those cases. So the, the threshold is very low. The chief of police has the ability to revoke a uh, license to carry. The and, and Any chief of police or only the chief of police who issued it? The chief of police who issued it, but if you if you um, had a license to carry, let's say in North Andover, and you had a problem down in Saugus, the Saugus police are going to call North Andover and tell them, and your license to carry is going to be in jeopardy. 
Understood. So certainly, certainly you don't want to have any sort of a um, a problem, uh, a, a dispute or a problem, a traffic, uh, a, a car related uh, problem, an OUI or anything like that. You're going to really jeopardize your license to carry. Thank you. Anyone else on the board? Uh, this is Steve again. Uh, Kevin, I <clears throat> back to the scenario between 8 p.m. and 10 a.m. What is the check and balance if someone wanted to admit more than one non-member? Steve, what do you what do you mean by check and balance? What's the consequence of bringing more than one person in there? What is the first of all? Can it be done? And then how would it be caught? And what are the ramifications? Well, the ramifications would be uh, suspension or loss of, uh, of uh, your membership. It would be pretty drastic. And so those those rules are going to have to be abided by by all members. Um, in terms of catching them, um, it, it, there's going to be re it's going to be recorded who goes in and out of the facility. And so. Uh, it, that that's it's going to be a, a zero tolerance policy for that. So what you're saying, Kevin, is it would be identified on a video that there was more than one person. That's correct. Thank you. Hey, Kevin, how much self policing goes on in in the field? And by that, what I'm kind of referring is is marrying the club to the local chief. You indicated that if someone has a problem. Uh, some, if a North Andover resident has some trouble down in Saugus, the chief of police down in Saugus is going to call the North Andover chief. Is is there any element of that true at a gun club? So if, if you've got a member who isn't playing by the rules or acting acting foolishly or dangerously or whatever it is, does the gun club need to report that kind of stuff? I don't know. I don't know of any requirement, but I, I can tell you that uh, gun ranges are not the place where that sort of behavior is going to be tolerated. So uh, the, the chances are that um, that's going to be documented. There's going to be some action at the club and, and probably uh, depending on the severity, it's going to be fact dependent. It would be reported to the chief of police if that's what you're asking me. It is. Thank you. Anyone else on the board? Kevin, this this is Ellen talking. Um, a quick question with the after hours. I mean, I I, I I'm struggling with the unattended after hours numbers only portion of this, which I think other board members are as well. But my question is that when a member comes in, is he allowed to only shoot certain guns after hours, or is it? anything that he brings in or, or owns or has stored away or, or you know, I, I, I'm just curious. The, the, uh, the, the range is primarily because it's a 75 foot range is primarily going to be pistols. So, you know, there were going to be members are going to be told what, what guns are allowed to be shot in the facility. So, Again, it's one of those situations where if someone brought in a, a gun that was not um, uh, permissible and against the rules, uh, action is going to be taken against them by the club, uh, which could include revocation of their uh, membership. So what is not permissible? Well, anything, any, any gun that would not be, uh, that would be illegal in Massachusetts would not be permissible. I'm unaware of what's not legal in Massachusetts. Again, I, I'm, I am not um, very educated on uh, shooting. For, for example, we're not going to have uh, fully automatic, automatic, automatic uh, weapons allowed at the facility. So if someone came in with a fully automatic weapon um, and used it in the facility, they did put their membership in jeopardy. Or well, something with a large caliber that would not be permissible in the facility. Now, so that... there's, a, there's, a whole, there's a whole list of, um, uh, as I mentioned in, in March, um, the Executive Office of Public Safety and Security publishes a list of prohibited firearms. The Attorney General also maintains such a list uh, of certain guns that can't be uh, bought or sold or used in Massachusetts. So 
those firearms would not be allowed at the facility. And if we ever sold a firearm that was on a prohibited list, that would be reported to the Department of uh, Criminal Justice and Training, which would in turn report that to the chief of police and our license to uh, operate the facility would be revoked. So what you're saying is I need to look at the list, uh, pull up the website from Massachusetts and look at the list, even if you know, they have a gun there. I, I mean, I'm not educated on what. Are, are, you, are you asking me if I know those guns off the top of my head? I don't, I'm sorry. Okay, yep. But like a 50 caliber handgun or a rifle or things like that, or guns that are automatic, fully automatic would not be allowed. No, no armor piercing guns or anything like that would be allowed, but I don't know the particular models um, that are on that list, but we'd abide by that. We wouldn't sell those, we wouldn't permit those. So basically if it's allowed in Massachusetts, it's allowed to at the shooting range. Is that That's correct? That's safe to say, okay. I would, I would, you know, say also since it's a 75 foot range, you know, it's not going to be, there's not going to be uh, rifles and things like that. It's going to be primarily pistols and small caliber, maybe a shotgun, but that's it. Anyone else from the board? Yeah, I, I just have a curious. This is Ron Fagan. I just have a curiosity question. So again, forgive me if it's a dumb question, but you know, are there any documented best practices? I mean, what I've gotten from the other meetings has been that well, you know, I used to shoot at this range in in you know uh, some you know, town near Melrose. I forget the name of it, but you know, I used to shoot this range up in Manchester, and they do this the way. This range on the Cape does it this way. And so there's a lot of kind of learned experience, but is there any sort of documented best practice that somebody would look and say, okay, this is what we've got to do to adhere to, you know, what the association or whatever else decides is the way to design and operate a shooting range? Well, Member Fagan, we, we did provide a proposed um, operating procedures manual where we derived information from a whole variety of sources including um, our, our, our firearm safety consultant um, Jerry Gallo who spent 34 years with the alcohol tobacco and firearms that's been submitted along with our application to the uh, chief of police to see what he thinks about those operating procedures but I, I don't know if there's any one particular best practices manual but we're going to follow uh, the learned experience of the people that um, not only the applicant has dealt with, but the consultants that we've hired to help us with this have dealt with. Yeah, no, thank you. I, I, I did, I did read that, but again, being um, you know not knowledgeable on this, it's hard for me to say. Well, what's not there that I should observe? You know, that I should see is not there. So, um, I, you know, for for all the uh, work that the NRA does with training and gun safety, never put together and said, you know, here's how you build your totally safe ideal shooting range well well i will say this um, am, am, am i muted or can you still hear me am i muted no no i can, can i can hear you i was i was muted so i couldn't answer you i'm sorry i oh, can hear sorry. you fine i'm sorry i well you know one of the things that we think is really a, a central part of what we're doing that's different from other um run-of-the-mill shooting ranges is that is that educational component with the virtual areas and the uh, training uh, the training that we're going to offer for the safe and proper use of firearms. So we're going to bring in instructors and, you know, that's really where the emphasis is. And of course, you know, with the law enforcement people in the area and those with licenses to carry, we want to make sure they're properly trained and they can refresh themselves. So it's really, um, it's one of those things that we think this is an appropriate site for this type of facility. It's not going to adversely impact the neighborhood. There's not going to be any nuisance or hazard to the public because there's no real pedestrians and uh, really it's uh, the facility that we propose in terms of the construction of the facility is going to be more than adequate for the operation of the uh, live shooting range and the air range in the retail facility so you know for all those reasons we're hoping that, that the ZBA grants us a favorable uh, vote on the on this thing and, and I'll say one thing further I, 
we've been at this now since I think um, last, was it last January, I think when I first got involved. So almost six, almost six months. And um, in the course of all that, I've talked with a number of people around, I live in North Andover, I've talked with a number of people around North Andover and people that um, work and uh, work in North Andover and, and those who, um, the chief of police and the, uh, and, and others. And I haven't heard anybody, uh, no, not a single person from the public raise any opposition to this um, proposal. And so I hope the ZBA will bear that in mind as they deliberate uh, whether or not to uh, grant a favorable vote on it. Thank you. Anyone else on the board? Paul, as a matter of uh, committee business, have we decided who's voting on this? I, I don't think that we've gotten that far. Okay. <clears throat> I'm sure I'm sure Jennifer knows, but we certainly have not gotten uh, gotten there yet. When we were approaching the vote, uh, I would certainly call out and get that clarified. Uh, for for now, let's assume that everybody votes that way. Everybody is as as. Uh, um, as uh, I guess intensely pressing the matter and educating themselves uh, as they can be for the, for the greater uh, greater good here. If there's nothing else from the board, then I'm gonna look, look down the table at uh, Jennifer and ask, Jennifer, has anybody emailed in any questions or comments? Not hearing you, Jen. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. We're getting there. One more try. Can you hear me now? It's a little crackly, but yes. Okay, I I have no emails. Brilliant. Thank you very much for closing that loop for us. You're welcome. <clears throat> So I'm throwing it back to the board. Is there anything else that we want to ask the applicant directly before uh, you know, the, the next stage is an element of deliberation? I think we will reserve reserve the right to ask another question after the question or two or 10 or 20 to the applicant uh, after deliberations or during deliberations. But it's seeming to make sense that we advance the hearing in that manner. Is there anything else from the board? Yeah, this is Steve. Uh, so Kevin, when will the chief be addressing and responding with his role and call it the, the safety associated with the shooting range, please? Uh, all I can tell you is give you an update on where we are in that process. We, we applied, um, we have paid the, uh, there's, a, there's a fee that we had to pay to the police department. I, I know that uh, Jennifer has been down there as recently as last week to have fingerprints and uh, provide them with some information. Um, but uh, as of yet, I, I don't have a, a time frame or a sense of when the chief is gonna decide. I, I suspect he may be um, waiting to see what the ZBA does and what the planning board does. Uh, we're back in front of the planning board in July. Um, so we're hoping to, to close our, our hearing here tonight and then go before the planning board in July and then I suspect sometime thereafter the chief will will um, take up the license issue. Thank you. I, I have, this is Ellen. Kevin, I do have a question. Again, I, I just still I, I just need you to convince me why a 24-7 shooting range. I, I just I have such a a, a problem with I don't mind anything else. I think it's great with the uh, education and the ability to, you know, to shoot. But I, I'm having such a hard time with the 24/7 unattended, 8 to 8 p.m. to 10 a.m. Is someone, you know, going to review the tapes every day? I, I have such a hard time with that. I, can, can you convince me on other in other board members why it's needed? I, I don't understand why it's needed. Well, well, really, the only comment I'd make to that is that this is really normal for um, for these types of uh, facilities that they're open 24 hours, seven days a week, and and I think part of the reason for that is there are a lot of uh, 
first responders and law enforcement people who work odd shifts. They wouldn't be able to get there during the normal, you know, 12 to 8 p.m. type shift. So they go after hours. So they make that available to them so that they can uh, use the facility and stay sharp in their skills. So um, that, that's one of the reasons why we're, we're proposing that it remained a, a 24 hour facility. And of course, you know, we're gonna work closely with the chief of police on that, but uh, I, I've heard no, no objection from him. He knows what we're proposing. And um, I, I haven't heard any concerns on his part because that's really normal for the, for the shooting ranges. And as you heard from our, uh, our consultant um, in March, he's been to hundreds and hundreds of ranges and they're, they're all open 24 hours a day. So I, 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 maybe that's not the answer you wanted to hear, but that, that's what these ranges are. They're open 24 hours a day. I'm sorry. So we'd, be at a, we'd be at a real disadvantage if we tried to open just regular normal hours. You know what I mean? It's just in terms of attracting members and, and, um, and trying to make the business work. So. It's, it's for all those reasons. That's that's the nature of uh, shooting ranges. So can I'm sorry. I just have another couple of more questions. So the the ranges in the area are all 24/7. I didn't think Andover, the one in Andover, was 24/7. Yeah, I, I I believe that Mr. Hutchins is a member over in Andover. I think that is open 24 hours a day. I I. I I believe uh, Middleton is also open 24 hours a day. Atkins, um, is it Atkins, New Hampshire? Malden is open 24 hours a day. Um, it, it, it's very normal for these ranges to be open 24 hours a day. 24 hours a day, which is fine, but unattended 24 hours a day? No member, no, yes. um, no person on site? Yes. Hey, Kevin, what kind of authority does the, the chief have over something like this? Does, does 24 seven or, you know, 24 hours will be unattended, you know, whatever, eight to 10, eight at night to 10 in the morning. Uh, is, is he in a position to condition that, or I don't know, take, take that away if there's a violation or a discomfort is what, what's the role of the chief in those operating hours? Well, well, in, in terms of the overall operation, I mean, the chief is the absolute authority under the under the state law in terms of um, whether this place gets a license, keeps a license, you know, gets uh, its license suspended or revoked or anything like that. So he's the absolute uh, designee under state law for um, these types of facilities, uh, Mr. Chairman. So th theoretically, if there's if there's a problem in the middle of the night with the uh, you know the the key card and biometric, can the chief be as surgical as saying, "Hey guys, you got to uh, you got to employ an attendant overnight," or does the chief only have the authority to suspend the the license? Well, I, I think that if he wanted to condition that, he could condition it, and it, it, if the if the choices having your license suspended or, or providing someone to be there because you've got a you've got a history of violations during the 24 hour period I think that we would have someone there you know if that's what if, if that's if that's what occurred but you know based on the experience and the experience of um, our consultant they, they have very little problems if any uh, during the 24 hour period and, and these are facilities that are not out in an industrial zone, bordering an airport and a, a landfill and an incinerator. These are right in downtown uh, near restaurants and pedestrians and, and everything else. And they're open 24 seven and no one even knows that they're there. Um, one just recently opened up down in Dedham, right in the downtown, right off, right off High Street in Dedham. So, I mean, it, this is the norm uh, for these types of facilities. This one just happens to be ideally suited because it's up in an industrial zone and right down the street from the police station. Thank you. Anything else from the board? I have nothing else, thank you. All right, well, unless there is an objection, then perhaps we had, um, uh, why don't we put a pin on this part of the hearing and move into deliberations? 
I would ordinarily look up and down the table and search for uh, nods in one way or the other. So maybe I'll just go down, uh, go down the roster. Ellen, shall we move to deliberate? Um, yes, so moved. Um, do you want to? That's not closing the hearing. That's just deliberation, no. correct? Yeah. I, 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 I inartfully phrased that. I didn't, I, I didn't mean like move as in motion. I just meant like move the, move the hearing along and over to deliberations. I apologize for that confusion. Should, shall we shift the, shall we shift the hearing over to a, a deliberative mode? I, I'm in agreement with that. Uh, Alexandria? Works for me. Ron? Yes, I'm fine with that. Mike? Yeah, I think so. Steve? I agree. Frank? Missing you, Frank. Muted? Yep. Uh, All right, terrific. Yeah, I'm good with it. Terrific, thanks. Uh, and does anyone <clears throat> want to kick, kick off deliberation? I'll start. This is Steve, and I'm, it's the same theme. I. I feel like we're I'm I'm going to be potentially making a vote on something that really the area of my concern is is something that I don't know what the destiny is. So that just makes it hard. It's uh, just sharing what's on my mind. Understood. Anyone want to take the baton? Yeah. So I, I sort of share some similar feelings is, is that I, um, I feel like after a lot of meetings, um, we have sort of finally come to a place where I am mostly satisfied on the structural side um, in terms of the building and how it's set up and environmental controls. I appreciated that in the, the latest set, they, they really, they described the HVAC system that they would put in place. Um, I I still like am a bit hung up on 24 hour access and I get that that's what other firing ranges do. Um, I'm just not sure I'm comfortable with it and I, I'm still struggling with that. As, as Thank you. As am I, I'm, I'm, I'm having, I mean, I understand you need to be uh, marketable in, as a business, but um, I know, um, and you want to appear to, you know, the, the um, law enforcement, but I don't know law enforcement people who work 24 seven, I don't know if they work all hours. I know they have some days off in between where they can shoot. I'm, I'm not thinking they're working 24, they're working seven days a week, 24 hours a day. They are, there is some off time. And I understand you need that balance between family, but, so for me, I'm having a really hard time I, as well with the um, unattended hours. I, I mean, I've, ser I've tried to search on the internet, you know, for benefits and, and I, I, again, I'm just having a hard time with it because you're not going to know if there's an issue until the next day, if, if it's actually reviewed. Uh, I mean, so those, those are my issues. So if I if I may just ask a question of, of then Ellen and, and, and Michael, um, could you please clarify or or expand on the discomfort? Is it is it because there are people with firearms who are not being uh, monitored? Uh, this is Ellen. Yes, that's my discomfort. Yeah, that's that's my Yes, my discomfort is that another person can come in with a member and shoot. Um, it's not, for me, I have a hard time with guns anyways. So, for, and then to add that added um, feature of a free range of you can have another member with you without that policing of, you know, someone with you watching you and guiding you. Is, is is giving me unease. That's my issue. Yeah, and I'm sort of, you know, similarly trying to separate my my discomfort with firearms in general and my 
my specific concerns for this facility. Um, but you know, to, to, to some extent it's, you know, I, I think some of it is I have trouble with the idea of recreational use of firearms in general, which is, is that these are deadly weapons. These are meant to kill people. And, um, and so I just, you know, having un you know low control or uncontrolled environments in which people are using them makes me anxious and you know that also obviously makes me um naive with compared to how a lot of people in this country and in this area view firearms but it is sort of the one that i am ingrained with and i'm i'm sort of trying to figure out how that makes me feel about us sp this specific case in front of me Okay, so I can't say that I disagree with, with either of you. I have the same unease. However, I guess I attribute my unease to the fact that I am also not a gun owner. I have also not been trained in firearms. I did shoot on the freshman high school rifle team, but that was at a police station or police supervision, so it was somewhat different. But I also am cognizant of the fact that because just because I'm not part of that, I'll call it culture for lack of a better word, um, uh, you know, that may be influencing the unease I have, and maybe I should put that aside. I, my, I guess my feeling is, 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 as uneasy as it makes me, these people are going to have their firearms, whether they are in that range or they're outside of that range. And if they're going to be shooting off firearms, I'd rather have them in that range than out in my woods. So, uh, you know, I, I guess uh, I just see it providing an outlet for something that they are legally permitted to do. So this, this is Paul, and I think I'll, I'll, I'll take the baton just for a minute. In, in no way am I the first word, in no way am I the last word. I'm just kind of taking my turn is all. Um, and it's, it's a, a slightly longer answer, but I'm absolutely going to return to the topic uh, at hand. Um, but echoing a little bit of what what uh, what some folks have said is that this this has been a, a lengthy uh, hearing process for the applicant. Uh, it has not always been a, a, a smooth road as far as the process goes. Um, but we have certainly achieved a level of comfort. I forget which one of you said there has been. I will borrow it. A level of comfort with a number of the details here. I mean, we've talked about. Uh, and again, I may be echoing what others have said. I'm, I'm just packaging it for my own benefit. We have, uh, you know, we've gone through the construction safety. We've talked about walls. We've talked about interior noise. We have certainly talked about um, uh, the the with uh, great detail. Uh, we got a sound study, if that's the right language, uh, and that was something that was extraordinarily important to me, and I was grateful to hear. Um, both the results of the study and the explanation of the study suggesting that, you know, when we get all the way to the apartments 1,500 or 1,900 feet away, uh, you know, this at, at best is going to be a, a whisper. Um, we, have, we have talked about, um, um, you know, the, the police department. We finally got some element of support. No, yes, it's talking about the building and not necessarily about the operation. Uh, but it, again, I just want to reiterate that it's premature for the chief to be opining on the operation uh, since that will be his own and uh, separate process. And with all of that, I have, in spite of the fact that I share the trepidation that many other board members, uh, and I'm probably, if I'm overstating you, then I'm sure you'll, you'll come back in, but the trepidation, the anxiety, the reluctance that I have is um, that there's not somebody monitoring this ultra hazardous activity for whatever the whatever it is for uh, you know 10 hours 14 hours a day uh, you know that this business will be operating without somebody air quotes in charge that gives me a lot of anxiety and I need to examine that much like the some of the other board members have a lot of the anxiety comes from I'm not a person who is from or of the, you know, the, the gun culture, whether it be personal safety or recreation. I'm just not in that space. A firearm, uh, you know, uh, bearing, bearing myself here, a firearm terrifies me. Even if it's on the hip of a, you know, a North Andover police officer, 
full, fully holstered. We are not in a dangerous situation. The fact that I am that close to a deadly weapon terrifies me. That doesn't mean that I should be imposing my terrors on folks who are not terrified by guns, by folks who are indeed comfortable with firearms and who are perhaps trying to make their kids or other people in the community comfortable with responsible use of firearms. That's, that is a, a logical, that's a rational approach. I am still in my gut, irrationally fearful, not just for myself, because I'm probably, I'm not in that end of town very often. So the likelihood of myself being injured way, way up there is pretty much nil. But I am fearful for the balance of the community, the people who travel to, work in, recreate at, attend the, the gun range. I am getting extraordinarily paternalistic when I say, I fear for the safety of people who want to be around guns. <clears throat> so the only, not the only way, but the way that I need to get around that is to try to eliminate that or, or, or mitigate that irrational stuff and suggest to myself that there are folks who are smarter about this stuff, who have more experience with this stuff, who knows what is normal. And I'm not necessarily referring to the applicants in this because it doesn't sound like there's, you know, uh, you know, we don't necessarily have to take the applicant's word for it. This is headed to the expert in the field, the, the person that this town has hired to watch my back, to watch your back and to watch everybody's back who walks into a gun club is the chief of police. And my expectation, although I do not know this, I have every expectation that the chief is going to take this extraordinarily seriously if this gets to his desk. And if the chief of police is a guy who says, you know what, it is normal. You know what, it is safe. You know what, it is safe. There are safeguards. There are ways of doing this. So we will allow 24 hour access, 14 hours of which will be entirely unmonitored by a live person. There will be no one to respond to an emergency and that's okay. And you, you know what, that's entirely, it's entirely likely that that is fine. You have to accept some level of risk in any activity. Unfortunately, the level of risk here, however low it may be, the probability may be minuscule. The trouble is the effects are life and death. So with, with that drama, again, it's, uh, it's, it's not my intention to run away from my responsibilities. And one of my responsibilities is evaluating this application for a special permit for the use. And so their use therefore is the operation of a gun club. I'm not, I do not want to run away from my responsibility to evaluate this application, but I absolutely do want to leave the experts, the opportunity to make an expert opinion. In my mind, the chief of police is in the best position possible to evaluate this. He knows a lot better than I do. So therefore, when I look at the, the, the two inches of materials in front of me, when I think about the hours that we have spent pouring, pouring over this application in order to try to ensure that North Andover doesn't just get a gun club, but it gets a, a responsibly constructed and responsibly operated gun club, I feel awfully comfortable, particularly when I know that there are other members on the team who may know more about this than I do that will take this application or the or different application, you know, the, the, the business license or whatever it's called that the chief would need to review, you know, if and or when the, the zoning board gives a favorable determination. So uh, uh, again, this is not so much deliberation as kind of a kind of a speech letting folks know in a long winded way that, yeah, I am, I am comfortable with the application. I'm extraordinarily uncomfortable with 14 hours of unmonitored gun club activity. And I got to get comfortable with that because there are people who know better than I do how to, whether to allow that and how to manage it if they do. So I guess, so th thank, thank you all for enduring me. And, and who's next? So Paul, I just want to throw out one thing there with, with regards to your views there. So thank you for that. Um, so I'm a, I'm a chemist in my day job. And, um, you know, I, I feel like I understand the stuff that I work with really well. And I, I understand the chemicals that I have really well. And I, you know, I'm naturally wary of the opinions of outsiders with regards to things like chemical safety. 
Uh, however, I would say that over the last century, uh, leaving chemical safety and disposal to uh, chemists has led to a lot of disasters. And so that sometimes the, the experts who are embedded in the field of, of that topic are not actually always the best point of view on those topics. And so that, you know, sometimes it's, it's still worthwhile listening to the naive outside point of view. This is Alexandria. So I'm going to pipe in here for a minute because I think I'm probably the one most comfortable with firearms and not scared to death of a firearm. Um, in many ways, I think as comfortable as I am with firearms and the idea of a shooting range being in our town, I too am still uneasy about 14 hours. And I guess my question becomes is I also understand the need for first responders who schedules Yes, they may get a day off here or there, two days a week off, but that has to be used for other things. Um, so I guess my question becomes is whether the applicant would be looking to entertain the idea of making 24 hours available for first responders only and not just members, but members who are first responders. Because I think that might ease a lot of the members, even the ones who aren't comfortable with firearms, um, knowing that there is somebody who is in the first responding field who would have responsibility, who isn't going to be a member, who was at home having a few beers and said to their buddy, hey, let's go to the shooting range. Um, at least I would like to think that most first responders would be smarter than that. Um, so I question whether the applicant would be amenable to that idea. And if that would ease some of the members of the board. And what, let's put let's put a pin in that because there may be more questions for the applicant. Why don't we perhaps we can talk about that as a as a board first responders only condition, um, and then we will certainly circle back to the uh, to the applicant to ask them directly. What are the, what are the balance of the board members? Uh, what's your reaction to that kind of thought? This is Ellen. Uh, for me, no, that wouldn't make a difference um, because I mean. Even though that is your profession, I think there's a lot of people who are very, well, a lot who are very responsible with guns. Um, I, I don't think that would make a difference for me being, having them just be members to only 24 hour access with, with um, first responders. I, I, again, that's a difference in my decision making. Any other reactions? Yeah, this Steve. So uh, this uh, uh, may sound surprising, but cons all things considered, I think that the construct the shooting range, the location, the construction, and I think the call it the the demand out there for such a facility. I think all those I think all those things are positive, and I and I support that. And so the, um, and I, I have to have confidence that the police chief is, uh, it will take care of the safety element of this. So I, my, uh, you know, the, my lack of experience in this area, I'm, I'm setting that aside and looking at this objectively I'm, um, I, I think that the, the plan and the need and everything is there. And, and um, I, my, I have to give my confidence to the police chief. I'm assuming that the police chief uh, is fully aware that of what our, what our needs and expectations are. But if I'm in favor of it, Minus, I, I mean, with as long as that box is checked, that he knows that we've entrusted him with the safety element. That's that's my that's my thoughts. Any other thoughts? Uh, yeah, this is Frank. Um, I think at the first meeting, uh, someone in the audience brought up the point that the. Uh, 
the Andover Sportsman's Club is actually in North Andover. And they maybe there's some um they may not operate exactly the same as this this operation as far as the public is allowed or not allowed. But they, they mentioned that it's open twenty four hours as well to their members. And um now that was someone someone from the audience who said that uh, whether it's true or not, I'm not sure. But if if that's true, that gives me um, you know more confidence in in this working out because the the police chief in town has experience with with one already, I, I, I guess. And if it operates 24 hours there for members, I I think you would be able to you know, come up with rules and regulations for this one to, to function similarly. But um, I'm prefacing that on, um, on what that member of the audience said be it being accurate. Um, but, but that would give me a lot more, more confidence in this location. And that's another one that we'll throw back to the applicant when the moment comes. If I may ask a little bit of a technical question. Um, if this particular site were zoned for recreational use broadly, would they still need a special permit for firearms usage? I don't think, I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. Is there anybody on the line? Again, not opening up to the applicant just yet. Mr. Hutchins, maybe? Uh, this is uh, Paul Hutchins. If it's allowed by use, it would only be up to the chief to decide on this. Okay, thank, thank you. you, Paul. Paul, I this is Ellen. I have a question. Even the twenty four seven portion of it, the, uh, the hours of operation. Yes. So recreational use, I thought, in the bylaw has a um, hours of operation. Uh, guideline. Which you guys just can decide on. You could change the hours. No, no, no. What I'm saying is if this was zoned for um, recreational use and not before the um, board of whatever, whatever board we are, zoning board, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, <laughs> and up to the police of uh, the chief of police. I thought that our bylaw had hours of operation. Only but, for outside. Only for outside. Okay. We have we have plenty of clubs that uh, you know uh, gyms and stuff like that, recreation that could stay open until midnight and stuff like that. You know what I mean? It would have to be approved by planning when when they go for um, that part of it. They okay. would have to they would have to present their hours, and they'd have to be agreed. So I think mean, just just to clarify that um, I don't know who asked Michael. Did you ask about that? That if this was not, if this was zoned in the proper place, that and they they would still have to go to a board. Just to clarify, to have their hours of operation as requested in the in this application as well. So it's okay, not that's helpful. Thank you. Y yes, they would. Okay. So I would just chime in i guess that uh, i don't having access limited to um first responders is an interesting idea i don't think it's a bad idea i'm not sure it's a necessary idea i would be more comfortable with not having untrained guests <laughs> coming in at two in the morning i think that gives me more trepidation than having trained people come in at two in the morning. So I don't know if that is something that could be considered in, in, in you know, otherwise. You know what, Ron, that's a great point. I'm open to members only, off hours without guests. So I, I you know, because for me, it gives, it gives the opportunity for someone I, I know it's a different it's a different group of people who are very safety oriented and you know NRA. It, it just and it may sound like I don't shoot. I've I've shot 
a lot of guns before. I mean, I've always never, I was never licensed. Um, I shouldn't say that out loud and on tape here, but um, for me, it gives me a little sense of ease if just, just the members without a non-member can attend on the off hours. So I would be open to that as well as, as, your, as you suggested. Because then you have your due diligence of someone who has a valid license, someone who's not going to bring in, you know, someone who is not able to shoot or has the, you know, so you have your members only card, you swipe it and that's it. So your intent is to go shoot, you want to release whatever you need to do, how the applicant said, oh, you know, our first responders, policemen want to shoot off hours. I don't need to see to have, you know, with a buddy who was ever also a member as well. So I have no problem with that. Thank you for clarifying, bringing that to my attention, Ron. I think I would also be more comfortable with that. That just that that at least reduces the the uncertainty. Um, yeah, that's all I have to add to that. Any other reactions? from the board regarding above members only. Uh, Alexander, what, um, how old do you have to be to carry to get a, if you know, how old is the youngest age to carry? Is it 18? Uh, 18? 18 is when you go to the, your local, you go to the police station that you live in. So if you live in Lawrence, you go to the Lawrence PD. <laughs> If you live in Andover, you go to Andover, and that's the soonest you can get it. I will tell you, they do do a background check all the way until they have a juvenile record when they check your background. Oh, okay. So if you did something as a juvenile, it pops up when they do their background check. Really? <laughs> Believe you me, it does. So if you have issues, if you have criminal records that involve, you know, assault and batteries, anything against law enforcement, that can discredit you from getting your license. And the discretion is huge on the chief of police. So I'll fill the pause asking any other reactions, thoughts from the board. Seeing and hearing none, unless there is objection, then perhaps we will uh, ask the applicant to respond to some of the ideas. Any objection? I'm good. All right. Attorney Foley, then. It looks like we are, you are back on the floor here. I guess you, in, 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 in general terms, perhaps I would ask you, uh, you know, is there anything that you can uh, confirm or that you heard that you could confirm or correct or respond to? Um, generally, I think I only have three things written down that were, you know, questions to be directed right at you, but I suspect you've caught those and may have caught other things as well. So, well, anything that your... I don't catch, anything that I don't catch, Mr. Chairman, please let me know. But uh, I listened with interest to the deliberations. I want to say first, I Greatly appreciate um, your patience and the members' patience through this entire process, and really appreciated the comments and the concerns by the board about all of this. Um, and I was glad, really, particularly appreciate the comments about trusting the North Andover Chief of Police. And it isn't wouldn't just be the Zoning Board of Appeals or the Planning Board or the residents of North Andover. Heck, the Massachusetts State Legislature entrusted the chief of police to make these types of decisions. It's in state law. Uh, that's who is the uh, authority on operations and um, retail sales of firearms in our communities. And there's a reason for that. Uh, they are versed in it, they've worked in the area. Um, I did want to point out that the Andover Sportsman Club is actually in North Andover and is open 24 hours a day. Uh, with regard to the 24 hour access, um, this idea of, um, you know, one of the reasons for it, as I stated earlier, is to accommodate those who couldn't go. And when you put yourself in the position of an average member, um, it's a recreational use. And, you know, they're going to do these things after work or after hours when they're not going to.
cause any sort of a conflict with other family obligations and commitments. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm not anticipating a flood of people being down there at, at two o'clock in the morning, but there might be the odd member that wants to do it. I really appreciated um, Ellen McIntyre saying that, you know, she would be more open to this and maybe uh, even get her a vote if there were no guests allowed uh, in 24 hours. I, I can tell you, Mr. Chairman, uh, while I was on mute, and I have uh, Jennifer Thompson here with me, we, we discussed that and would be open to that, just making the 24 hours for members only. After all, those are people who have licenses to carry. And, and as you heard from uh, one of your members who has a license to carry, um, if you have a license to carry, you want to do everything you can to preserve that license. You, won't, you don't want to do anything that would jeopardize that license because they're so difficult to get and they're so easy to lose. So. Um, you know, we, we trust people will have licenses to carry because of the background that they go through, but it would at least having that 24 hour access, Mr. Chairman, it would allow us to compete. And, and if we can compete, uh, if we can't compete, we're not going to be able to flourish. And if we're not going to be able to flourish, we're not going to be able to, um, you know, meet our stewardship of uh, training people for the safe and uh, proper use of firearms in our community, which is one of the, uh, one of the, uh, primary reasons why we want to do this in the first place. So, you know, for all those reasons, I, I hope the board will act favorably upon the application. Thank you for those responses, Kevin. I think that you covered the items that I had written down, but I will look up and down the table at the board and, and ask generally, hey, uh, I think he caught everything. Did Was there anything that he missed to one of you board members? I'm not sure that it's anything that was missed. There was a, a, a comment that came out earlier about um, it was the intention of the facility to check everybody's uh, license to carry each year. And that, Paul, I think that was in response to your thing saying, you know, 364 days later or whatever, you know, or whatever, you have a five-year period. If you, if you screw it up in that period, you know, you can still use the facility. So, I, I don't know whether they would also be amenable to insisting that they do check everybody's license to carry each year as part of the membership uh, acceptance. Thank you, Ron. Fair comment. We'll uh, put a put a pin in that. See if look up and down the table. Any anything else, folks? I mean, that caught the bulk of it for me. Um, uh, and um, I would definitely be interested in putting a, a stipulation that only members be allowed off hours without guests. Great, thank you. Thank you. And anyone else? All right, then, uh, uh, Attorney Foley, I think we're going to throw this back uh, at, at you and your team. Uh, what kind of reaction would you have to a uh, condition that the LTC is checked every year of uh, membership? We have no problem. We have no problem with that, Mr. Chairman. The memberships will only be uh, a yearly membership, so each year they'll have to present their their license to carry in order to renew their membership. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. And just just to be clear, so there, there's a difference between an intention for practice and then us actually writing uh, writing the condition into the decision. And I think I'm hearing you say that that's your intention, but I want to ensure that there is not necessarily a negative reaction to it being written in as a condition. No, no negative reaction at all, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we'll, we'll do one more quick pass up and down the table to see if there are any final thoughts before we move into um, into a into a vote. So again, I'm kind of look, looking up and down the table. I'm not going to call the roll for this, but hope that anyone will jump in. Nothing from me. This is Ellen. I'm all set. Terrific. This is, Anyone this else? Is, yeah, this is Ron Fagan. I'm all set. Michael is I'm all set. Okay. Well, then it, it sounds like we are all set. The applicant has certainly said his or her piece. Uh, so we may be moving into a motion in which Ellen uh, Ellen is going to uh, take take that role. And just to remind everybody on the uh, you know on the board, you know this. The folks in the gallery, the applicant certainly knows. Anybody listening at home, all motions are made in the affirmative, uh, and the the vote 
will go either, you know, approved or denied. But just because a motion is made in the affirmative does not mean necessarily that the board is headed in that direction. Second element of this is we have a, 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 a high stack of papers here. We've had uh, a, a more, than, more than one meeting and a bunch of materials. And we are remote and we cannot offer each other support, which is what we often do. So as Ellen reads, and she is going to be articulating uh, the exhibits that will become a part of the decision, my suspicion is that she is not going to be able to be entirely complete. She will do a flyby, articulate some of the, the, the high points, you know, the, the perhaps the, the biggest broadsheet plan or the, the fattest binder. Um, but uh, uh, just saying it out loud that just because she does not articulate a piece of the packet that has become a part of the record does not mean that it will not be included in the decision. The motion will be made. If we go to a decision, I will be uh, pouring through the record and I will be picking out, or probably Jen and I will be pouring through the application and picking out all of the details and the list of exhibits will likely be much more extensive uh, than Ellen may include in her decision. The third item is uh, the conditions that the board is putting on it. Now, Ellen will certainly put it in her own words, but again, I'm looking kind of up and down the table to make sure that I think I heard that the, the board is interested in placing two conditions on the decision. Uh, the first of which is that there will only be members allowed during the off hours. So any unattended hours will not have, uh, you know, air quotes guests, but only members will be allowed with the key card and biometric. And the second condition was that the, uh, the uh, memberships to the club will be annual memberships and at each, uh, each renewal, the club will check the license to carry of, of the renewing applicant. So I'm looking up and down the table. Did I, did I get them all accurately? You did. I, I see it. And how do you know that I'm not going to have everything? I might decide to. You, you, you might decide to, and he, heaven forbid you actually slip in this remote environment. So I just want to be there to catch you, Ellen. Thank you for my safety net. So looking up and down the table, unless there's anything else and you better jump in within a within a second or two, I'm going to ask Ellen for a motion. Anything. Two seconds. One, two. I'll make a motion to close the hearing. Motion made uh, by Ellen McIntyre. Is there a second? I will second. second. Oh, there was a race. Ooh. I couldn't Alexandria identify. Alexandria will Let's... second it. Thank you, Alexandria. Motion made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 You, know, you know what? Fine. I'll go back. I should go down the roll. Ellen was right in the first place. We should also so establish who's at, voting. Yeah, that, uh, that's coming up. This is the just closing the public hearing. Uh, actually, you're right. This is the time. Um, Jennifer, so we have Paul, Ellen, Alexandria, and Ron. So we need one associate member. Do you, I suspect you know whose turn it is? Alexandria or Ron? Uh, they are voting. So yes. they are they are well, full members. So who is the who is the associate member? Whose turn Frank. is it from between Frank's turn? Frank can vote. All right. Yes. Okay. All right. So the motion to close has been made and seconded. Uh, uh, those in I'll say Paul, I am in favor of closing that. Ellen. Yes. Alexandria? Yes. Ron? Yes. And Frank? Yes. So it is unanimous, it is closed. Is there a motion, Ms. Vice Chair? There is a motion. Um, I'm going to grant a, a special permit pursuant to Town of North Andover Zoning Bylaw Section 195-4.14, Industrial 2, District 1, District I recreation uses for an indoor shooting range to grant the special permit for the premises located at Holt Road LLC for pro I mean for the excuse me for the petition of Holt Road LLC for property at 210 Holt Road map 007.0 lot 0014 North Andover Mass 0145 in the I2 zoning district with the condition that oops. Sorry, that number one, to have 24 access to members only. 
And the second condition to have um, the license to carry checked on a yearly basis on renewal of membership to have the LL, the license to carry checked yearly on a annual basis with membership. And I am going to reference number one, the SOP that was submitted, standing operation operation procedure number two. Design guide by Megit. Number three, three uh, um, various construction narratives by Port One Architect um, construction plans. Uh, number four, site plan dated 1019, which includes G1, C 1.1, C 1.2, C2, A 1.1, A 1.2, A 2.1. Number five, a narrative which we received from the chief of police. Number six, a site plan with parking from Green Sale dated 11-1-19. And then, uh, oh, I'm sorry, then the letter from Charles Gray, which was the chief of police dated 318. And I'm going to clarify number five, the narrative which was received in March. And I am going to do a general number eight with any other documents to have been submitted upon the chair's recommendation when um, when it's written. I don't know if I missed anything or if you need to make anything prettier, then I'm sure you will. I, 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 I just want, if you could, Ellen, so, so the motion, you read the legal notice, the first paragraph. I don't think I heard the second paragraph. So I made a motion to, re, uh, to grant a special permit I'm a little rusty. I apologize. It's been a while since I've been in the clerk position to grant the applicant to grant the special permit pursuant to town and not the Andover. And then I cited the petition and where it was. So I, if okay. you like to do it again, I will. With I, a motion to grant the special permit pursuant to the town and not the Andover bylaw section 195-4.14 industrial two district. I uh, recreational uses for an outdoor shooting range for the petition of Holt Road LLC for property at 210 Holt Road map 007.0 lot 0014 North Andover Mass 0145 in the I2 zoning district. And and I hate to do this. I think I heard you say outdoor shooting range, but for clarification purposes, this is an application for an indoor shooting range. Indoor shooting range. I could have. All right, motion motion made. Is there a second? Please say so with your name. Uh, Ron Fagan, second. second. Ron got in. Ron Ron uh, got in. So Ron has seconded the motion. Motion made and seconded. I will uh, call the roll again. Just looking at the masthead myself. I am an I. Uh, Ms. McIntyre. Yes. Ms. Jacobs. Yes. Mr. Fagan. Yes. Mr. Killalay. Yes. That, so that is a 5-0 unanimous vote. The special permit is approved. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kevin and your team. And thanks very much for the board for its thoughtful deliberation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of the board. So the next item on the agenda, everybody, uh, on the printed agenda is uh, item four is 43 Linden Avenue, lot A, and uh, Linden Avenue, lot B is number five. Those have been put over to July, oh golly, forgive me. Jennifer, it's July what, 14th? Yes, July 14th. Thank you very much. Which means the next item on the agenda is a new public hearing of 30 Union Street. This part I have not orchestrated. Do, do we have the applicant on the line? Yes, Mr. Chairman, and hello, members of the board. We are long standing, standing members of the community interested in staying in our home, improving our property. We are asking for a variant on the left side of our home. Architect Julie Johnson um, to help with the um, need to locate the addition. Excuse me, Mr. Kelly, I'm going to stop you before you go on further. We need to open up the meeting first. I think that she had just asked if you were present. I'm so sorry. Moving happens just before we have to open up the meeting for uh, legal purposes first. Okay. But, uh, but we do have. 
I actually want to thank you. We do have the applicant, and if if we could, I had a lot of trouble understanding the applicant. I didn't even hear the hear much of the introduction. So Ellen is going to read the read the notice in order to open this, and then I would ask the applicant if you are on speaker, would you kindly um, not be on speakerphone? Ms. McIntyre, please. Actually, Paul, before we go back, I want to go back to London Street because the petitioner. Um, uh, Tom Zarico uh, did not want to go till July. He wanted to go to the next uh, oh. meeting. So I have the time constraint here that the waiver, and just to, I want to reference that they did sign that with the um, recommendation that they go to a public hearing with the, a, a physical public hearing. Okay. Just for the record. Thank you, Ms. McIntyre. Okay, so I will read the legal notice for uh, Union Street. The notice is here for the given that the Board of Appeal will hold a public hearing remotely via conference call on Tuesday, June 9, 2020, at 7.30 p.m. to all parties interested in the petition of Kevin and Holly Green for property at 30 Union Street, Map 014, Lot 036, North Andover, Mass, 18405, in the R4 Zoning District. The applicant is requesting a variance pursuant to town, not, town of North End of the Zoning Bylaw, Section 195-7.3, Yard Setback in the R4 Zoning District. The application, the applicant is requesting a variance from Section 195-7.3B, Yard Setback, in Table 2, Summary of Dimensional Requirements of the Zoning Bylaws for the left side of Yard Setback in R4 District for the construction of addition onto the existing home. Left side Yard Setback proposed is 4.3 feet. Left side yard setback required is 15. The relief variance needed is 10.7. Due to the state of emergency order, town hall is currently closed. Therefore, the applicant and supporting materials are available for review via town and North Andover website, www North Andover Mass Gov under document center by the order appeals, Paul D. Paul Koch, Junior Esquire Chairman. And I also want to cite that the legal Notice the supplement legal notice to this uh, government governor governor Baker's order. Thank you, Ms. McIntyre. And with with that, if we could get the applicant to uh, to start over, the floor is yours. Can we introduce yourself, uh, name and address, and then tell us a little bit about the application. <laughs> This is Holly and Kevin Green from 30 Union Street. We are longstanding members of the community interested in staying in our home and improving our property. We are asking for a variance on the left side of our home. We also have our architect, Julie Johnson, on the line with us to help us help describe our need to locate the addition to the left side of the house. Hello. Can you hear me? Am I on? Sometimes. Okay, hold on. Let me try. Hi, this is Julie Johnson. Can you hear me okay now? Yeah, that's much better. Thank you. Okay, yes. Sorry, I put the phone closer to my face. <laughs> that will help us. Um, <laughs> so, so what we are proposing here, the circumstance, I assume you all have the packet with this remote format as far as the, the plot plans that show the piece of land we're dealing with, yes? We do, yes. Okay, um, so, so the circumstance is that um, the existing lot of, of land that we're dealing with is sort of in a pie-shaped configuration, and the existing house um, located on the property that fronts Union Street is set in such a way that it's um, parallel to Union Street, whereas the outbuilding, the existing outbuilding of a garage is located towards the rear of the property and um, parallel to an, an angled side yard. Um, the, the issue becomes when this family is trying to expand their property um, and you know, hopefully continue to live in the house longer term, which they've already been there 16 years, they love the neighborhood, they'd really like to maintain and, and grow with the house. 
our only opportunity is it's extremely restricted in terms of the existing garage location and the existing house location. Our, our only real opportunity was to come out towards the eastern, um, the left-hand side, if you will, from the front of house and towards the rear. Um, and, and we chose to do it in a way that um, the, the, there's an existing side porch that already um, encroaches exactly the same as we are on the side property line, on the eastern side line, um, the existing existing through sort of three-season porch. What we're proposing to do is is use that existing line and continue further on down towards the rear of the property. That allows us an opportunity to create the extension of additional square footage they need without um, without impeding access to their garage building. That's that's one of the largest factors here is that we we examined multiple opportun options for if we could solely come out the rear, if we could come out towards the right hand side, all kinds of. Um, configurations were attempted. However, all of these began to then impact their ability to use their garage building. Um, so so we, we felt this approach was, was frankly, in many respects, the only approach to be able to add to their, their piece of land. I think that outlines it. What, do you have anything else to add, Holly or Kevin? No, I think that um, perfectly. I'm I'm having trouble hearing. Okay, I think that says it perfectly. What Julie had said. You agreed with what I had said. Is that what you said, Holly? Yes, I agree okay. with what Julie says. Okay. I I mean the the bottom line is we really did attempt multiple configurations, but the the constraints of the site by the nature of it it's being in this pie shaped configuration. I I did a, a quick calculation that the front. The street frontage um, is, I think it's, uh, you know, in terms of the decrease from the front of the property to the back that creates this sort of pie shaped is larger than 50% reduction. So it really, it, you know, that combined with the existing structures on the site very much limit any opportunity to expand um, the house. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what the what the expansion is, please? Sure, of course. Um, so the house to begin with, I I don't know if you have. Um, I assume you have all the plans there, the existing existing elevations, existing plans. Um, it, it was a relatively small cape to begin with. The rooms were um, some somewhat um, condensed in in many ways, and they're looking again for a long term long term use of the house, and so. We went through multiple efforts to re, um, to bring the master suite uh, down to the first floor living level and expand uh, where the current screen porch is, bringing the kitchen out into that zone and create the the great room appeal, which would be the kitchen connected to the dining room, connected to a, a family room area at the rear rear of the addition, abutting their private backyard. So really making the house um, appropriate for longer term. Oh, all right. That uh, sounds like a, a pregnant enough pause. Maybe I'll throw it to the board. Uh, any board members uh, with questions? Yeah, this is Ron Fagan. I have a, a couple of questions. Sure. Um, from From looking at this map, and looking at the porch, the porch is already sitting only 4.3 feet away from the uh, property line. That's that's correct. That's correct. So, just a curiosity question: um, Was that a previous variance, or was this something that was just grandfathered in? I envision this was grandfathered in because when I when I looked back on the original original plans um, from when the when the house was built which the homeowners had in their possession I, I believe it was in the 50 was it 52 um, that that existing um, that that porch was a part of that initial drawing set so I, I envision that all happened at the same time okay and from if I'm standing out on Union Street mm -hmm. and looking at the house I really I'm not seeing any sort of different profile 
than I'm seeing today. That basically what you're adding is a single floor That's that correct. goes behind the existing structure, and I will not see anything different from Union Street. That's correct. It's going to maintain a one-story expression where the current one-story porch structure was, and it will wrap around as a one-story. So really trying to sort of maintain the cotta cottage curb appeal that they've always liked in, in a way that gives them that extra space out the back. Thank you. Um, I do have some questions. Um, of course. So my, my question is, so you're not, in, because that porch is on your, your um, plan anyways, you're not increasing the non-conforming of the lot. So I'm just curious why a variance was needed? Uh, technically, we were told because where there's additional square footage directly in line with, at, you're pointing out the exact thing. The, it already encroaches on that on that property line and the, the required setback. Um, but since we're we're gaining additional square footage back towards the rear yard along that same line, uh, we were told we needed to go through the variance process. Please correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> I, I'm actually not sure, so I'm going to pull it to Paul. Did you, I mean, did you, to Paul, to our building inspector, did you need a, another variance for a building area, a CBA, or are you? What was, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. So, I mean, how big is the addition as opposed to what's there for the, you know, the houses, how many square feet? Oh, uh, let's see. Uh, forgive me, I don't have that statistic offhand. Holly, do you have that? It's approximately 1,300 square feet. I didn't hear that, I'm sorry. Could you say that one more time? You're, you're a little choppy. 1,300 and your addition is how much? It's going to be 600 square feet. Say that one more time. 650. 650. I, I know I gave you the calculation. I just don't have my hand on it at the moment. 650 is the addition. Yes. And the original is approximately 1300. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. That does ring a bell. I just don't have that calculation in front of me. I need to ask my our building, um, our building inspector. So is that more than what's allowed? And the other question is, why would is the variance needed if you're not increasing the conformity with the setback? Again, we were told when when the builder applied for the the building permit with the outlines as shown, um, it was rejected in order to go through a variance because we were encroaching within the side setback requirement. I, I, yeah, I want an opinion from the building inspector who is actually on here. Paul. Yep. Sorry, I'm still mute. I'm talking on it's still mute. My my apologies. I'm not great at this one. <laughs> Well, the original plan, the way it was mapped out, if you look at it, they have 3.8 in the back corner. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? So that would be changing the encroachment. Unfortunately, it wasn't re-clarified that that is the overhang. It's not the original structure. It's not the structure that's being built. It's the overhang. So technically, they don't need a, a variance. I hate to say this, and I don't actually hate to say it, but they're right because going back, you want me to state where it does kind of fall into this one? I could give you the um, one ninety five dash nine point three four. Um, in either case, the altar structure must comply with current building coverage and building height, which it does. Um, with all current yard setbacks, or the alteration is to the side or face of the structure which encroaches upon a required yard setback, and the alteration does not further encroach upon the required yard setback, which it doesn't. 
because it doesn't go to 3.8, it's actually 4.5. It actually opens up a little more back there. So they gain two, they actually gain two inches on the back corner. I, I, I do agree with that, that logic when you continue the line of the existing porch further towards the, the rear of the property. You're right, we are kind of pulling away from the property line a touch. However, I, when I've dealt with other towns, at least the um, whenever you whenever you do um, add the addition in in that let's say if you if you carry your the volume of the existing porch and you carry where we're growing addition out towards the back, we're obviously further you know going into where there is no building now in the setback so i guess i wasn't surprised to see them tell us we had to go through a variance process for this it's just my concern because i don't want you to have to go for a special permit as well because your lots undersized your frontage is undersized so when you're starting opening up a can of worms like that then you, you uh, no no i well do you, do you see what I'm saying with this? I, yeah, I do see what you're saying. However, we were told we only had to go through the variance process. I mean, if you're going through the logic of you're increasing it, then you're increasing everything. You're increasing the whole nonconformity of the lot. And, and then if you do your, your CVA as well, you're going, I think, over the amount that is allowed. So. Um. In terms of lot coverage, of the percentage of the original of the original house, because the lot coverage is. Um, I'm, sorry, is I'm sorry, it's the, the, the lot coverage. I think we're 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 really fine because the existing is only twenty two point nine percent, and with even with the proposed addition, we're only covering twenty seven point eight. I, I'm using the wrong term. So when oh. you when you're house when your addition is almost 50 percent of what your house is i think you need a, a, a special permit or a variance for that as well as one of our bylaws i can't i don't have my bio with me i apologize and i can't show it so that's why i'm going to refer to thank thank god you're here paul so i think that might be something as well She doesn't, yeah, she doesn't fall under that because she's only 650 and I think, like they said, the original house is 1500. Thereabouts, yeah. I thought you said 13. Can I add in the, the, the square footage of the house right now is 1325. I'm, Holly, you're, is that Holly? You're a little choppy again. Yeah. Can you, can you go off speakerphone so we can all hear you? Julie, I just sent the totals to you on your phone. It's 13.5. We're going to 1855. Okay, so I'm sorry. So I, I see the text. So you're you have 1,325 feet currently, and then you're growing it to 1,855 feet. Am I reading that correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so having said that, if I'm quickly doing the math, we're under that 50% rule, correct? I don't know if it's exactly 50%. I don't know the exact percentage, to be honest with you. I mean, I will have to look it up. Ellen. I mean, yes, when this off. was... Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. This, that's, that's in the watershed. That only falls in the watershed. So this wouldn't even apply to us. That, would, that doesn't apply. That would be under special. <laughs> yeah. so I, actually, I'd like to look that up. So I'm sorry. I'm going to just take a second to look that up. I need to get my variance. I, I thought you could, you're only allowed a certain amount. I mean, just to, for looks wise, when you have 50% of an addition put onto a home. I might be, I might be um, putting my age into this and Okay. I don't know if I think it's going to change. We're all digging here. Okay. And again, you're still not, I'm still not sold on why you need a variance because you're not increasing the non-conformance. Well, well, we're now inhabiting more of the setback than we currently were. 
So let me, if I can, uh, regarding the uh, the percentage, the square foot, and the percentage, just this discussion, and this is Steve Sidey. I'm f trying to follow along, <clears throat> and on page three of four of the variance application. As I've been hearing, I mean, shouldn't the numbers that we're talking about all be illustrated on this page, talking about the existing lot, the proposed lot, and as I listen to the conversation, okay, I'm not necessary. I'm not tying out. Plus, there is some changes that have been that have been made manually. So, when it comes to the existing lots and the proposed lots, can we? Just have clarification. Can I have clarification, please, on the existing and what the proposed is, as far as the uh, the square footage, et cetera, the percentage and square footage? Yes. Um, so I'm sorry, uh, Holly. As I do recall, having you had to submit that separately. Do you remember if it was on the application in a specific spot we can point to? Yes. Can you hear me? Can you uh, yes, hear me? I. Okay, so Jennifer, um, I know that Jennifer and I spoke and the existing lot is covered is 22.9% and the proposed lot will cover 27.8%. Okay, the, on the application that number 22.9 is, is struck and there's, I'm gonna say 27.8 or some, there's a number below it with an initial. Yes, I think Jennifer flip flopped the existing lot and the proposed lot numbers. Jennifer, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Yes, that was that was correct. Can you explain that why you made the changes? Um, so I actually had a coworker look at it, and um, she she said that I had it backwards. Okay. So but the proposed lot is getting smaller. Correct. Or the percentage you're putting an addition on, but the percentage has gotten smaller. How can that be? Yeah, it looks, I think it was probably correct originally. I believe we had it correct. Can I'm I sorry. ask, what is the question? Is it lot coverage? Are we talking lot coverage or what are we talking here? Because I'm kind of lost. We're talking about the per, the per, the uh, the percentage of the lot as it exists today, and then what it will be after the proposed uh, addition. And I think the numbers are inverted. We don't have lot coverage on an R four. On you you don't have lot coverage on what? I'm sorry. We don't have a lot coverage on it uh, in our our fours or our two or any of them. Uh, well, I'm referring to this is the variance application page three. Oh. I I had it as the existing lot twenty two point nine, and the proposed lot is supposed to be twenty seven point eight. And then I received an email from Jennifer saying that it was incorrect. I do believe that the first number that we had there as existing lot is 22.9 and proposed lot is 27.8 is correct. So that I th if I can restate, so I think what you're saying, Holly, is that what's actually on the zoning table on the certified plot plan that shows the 22.9 existing coverage and then it's growing to 27.8% is in fact correct. What they have in front of them though, it is not, the, um, Jennifer um, put a line through it and flip flop them. So what they have in front of them. Oh, so it looks like we, we actually took away an addition instead of yeah. our adding one. <laughs> so I, yes. I don't know how that, what happened there, but um, so what, what physically is written by the certified on the plot plan from the um, surveyor would be the correct 22.9 growing to 27.8. But I don't think that's, that's the that's an issue correct i mean just to come back to the idea of a variance because we're encroaching on the setback 
I mean, this was just uh, while you, we were talking about the. Uh, I, I was just confused trying okay. to determine how could it get smaller. So you've clarified that what I'm looking at is not correct. It's been uh, perhaps what you have, the, the strike through that you you must be looking at is yes, that's okay. Uh, thank you. So if that's if that issue is eliminated, and I, I think I was hearing folks, are, are we has a conclusion been drawn that we don't need a side setback variance? I, I guess I let that hang out there. I, I, yeah. I'm, I was assuming you were looking for the board members to respond. Yeah, I, yeah, I yeah that, that, that wasn't okay. for you. So, uh, uh, Alan, you brought, you brought up the issue, and I think I heard Paul being responsive. Did we come to a conclusion, you know, before, before the block coverage, you know, whatever that is, if we eliminate that, did we come to a conclusion that we don't actually need a side setback variance for this project? Based on the drawings we have in front of us, showing and you know, an, actually an increase in the setback, however mild. I, I, I didn't think it was needed. I mean, I, I for caution that I mean, I, I, because you're going from 4.3 to 4.5 which is further back and existing is 4.3 and you're not increasing the non-conformity of the lot on the side. I didn't think it was needed, but I'm not quite sure. I'm trying to go through the bylaw, which is uh, a little different. And I'm not sure on the, um, if you can have a 40% uh, or um, addition to an existing home. Those are the two things I'm on. I'm also unsure of the math. Okay. And I, I apologize for my lack of talking because I'm trying to review the um, bylaw. I appreciate the appreciate the effort to get this right, Alan. You know, you need not apologize. I just don't want the applicant to have to come back and say, you know, in the middle of building to say, oh, we forgot this. I don't, you, you know what I mean? I don't want to have, we need to yeah. come back with a special permit. Well, well if, if somebody needs a special permit, that's nothing we could hear tonight anyway. Correct. So it may, may not be the best use of our collective time to research that particular issue. Right. But I, the I mean, I. The app the application before us is a side setback. And if we're, if we're actually increasing the setback, then I was I was hearing a, a, a logic that we need, but perhaps don't need a, a variance. And I think that's what you're, you, you might've been looking for that, Ellen, or, or Paul, you guys both may be looking for that. I, I always thought the general rule was, if you don't increase the non-conformity, you don't need, um, that could just be for a special point. So I'll revisit that and perhaps uh, ask, ask you direct directly, Paul. Where where are you um, standing on this right now?
if I didn't hear you. Well, did you ask me? I'm sorry. I I, I, I did. Where where are you standing on this side setback question mark? I, I am um I'm staying in um unfortunately I we went through this, but we um they don't require because they didn't they're not going more non-conforming. They're staying within the conformity. They're actually, like I said, gained two inches. Gotcha. I said that that is that is helpful. Do we know if, if a side setback is is not needed and we don't necessarily need to be hearing this application or making a determination one way or the other? Do, is there an operation for um, amending the denial? We, and because it's the denial that kind of starts the variance process going. Is there a way to oh, retract oh, it is what we're saying? I, I'm sorry, can, yeah. can I jump in here for a second? This is Julie Johnson again. I'm just a little confused because when, so the builder, um, you know, submitted the plans initially to the town um, for the permit process. And then it immediately was flagged as though um, a portion of new construction, be it behind the porch, is inside the setback where there is currently no building. So therefore, it, you know, the requirement was you must go to the Zoning Board of Appeals to get a variance because you're encroaching into the set side setback in that zone that is currently not um, going into. Do you know what I'm talking about? If it was literally right in the footprint of the porch, I could understand saying, well, you're already doing exactly that. However, we are growing additional building structure inside that setback. I, we're already here, so I, I just don't want to want to make the stance um, that, okay, well, you don't actually need a variance, and then, then the homeowner attempts to go through the process of submitting again, only to then be denied and have to turn around and wait another month to get on the review process. Do you know what I'm – and in my yep. experience, this has been the standard with other towns in that even though yeah, one would like to make an argument that, okay, we're respecting, we're not going any closer to the property line. However, it's, it's repeatedly been told to me that, well, your addition growing behind that is, is in fact, that portion of is closer now to the setback. It's more than what um, the existing porch was. Do you know what so I mean? Then, so I, then, I can then, totally then see the logic we the, need. I'll rephrase the question and put it, put it to Mr. Hutchins, who is, who is the building inspector. And so therefore, uh, you know, if, if there's anything that happens after this meeting, it's going to go back to Mr. Hutchins. So okay. it's not like there's going to be a disconnect between the board oh, okay, and the wonderful. building inspector who's actually here. So I'm putting the question uh, again to Mr. Hutchins. Um, so cur currently the porch, uh, the, the side setback for the porch is 4.3 feet and that extends for 11 feet back. The applicant is saying, hey, yeah, sure, we're still going to be around 4.3 feet. We're still going to be, you know, in, in encroaching on the setback, air quotes. Um, but we're extending that encroachment by another 25-ish feet. So we're going from an 11-foot uh, kind of you know, distance of encroachment to 36 feet. Is that, is that meaningful to us, Mr. It's, Hutchins? Yes, it's still not making it more non-conforming because you're still not going over that 4.3. You're not making it more non-conforming. You're staying within that setback of 4.3. Um, the sure. problem is confusing. If you look below the 4.5 on the map, it says it says 3.8. Understood. Um, is that the architect there? Yes, I'm here. What is that number then? That's the confusing number. Yep. 3.8, I, I believe they might have flagged, uh, including the overhang. Uh, so do you know for a fact, or is it, I mean, I, I you Well, let me, let me do the math. So it's a nine inch overhang. So if it's 4.3, so minus nine inches, that would be three quarters. So let's see what he's doing here. 3.8, it must be. Again, this was done by the land surveyor. Oh, so I'm not so uncomfortable with that. Must be or could be. Or I, I'd like to know because that would make a difference because you would need more of a variance than the 4.3. You'd need a 3.8. Uh, you would need more uh, relief as requested. So, in, in, 
I'm sorry, I couldn't hear part of that. It was chopping in and out. Could you repeat? So my question is, I would need to know exactly, not a must be, could be, or perhaps answer, because if it is 3.8, that means that change changes your request for a variance. You would need more of a relief than you're requesting, and your legal notice would be changed and different. The 3.8, I'm sorry, let me, let me just men do the math quickly. Again, sometimes there's confusion when the surveyor prepares the certified plot plan, so I'm just trying to see what happened there. 3.8. Which I think you need more of a variance than your request. I think the 3.8 is from the house to the lot line, and the 4.5 is the overhang to the lot line. That's how I'm interpreting this plan. Or the opposite. Are you you're saying that the 3.8 is that would be obviously the lesser of the two numbers would be the to the edge of the overhang. To the the edge of the no the 3.8 would be to the edge of the of the uh, structure to the lot line. And the no. five is the edge of the overhang to the lot line. That, that couldn't be, Ellen, because no. no, you're going the backwards there. That would, be an, that would be an underhang rather than an overhang. Yeah. That would be an indentation rather than an overhang. The overhang would be closer to the lot line than the right. structure itself. Is it a is it an overhang? I mean, I don't yes. know. Yes, yes, that that is what it is. Okay. Um, however, if if there's a, an issue, um, we'd be certainly open to um, making the statement or condition here that the no section of the overhang could go closer than the 4.3, if that um, if that will allow them to move forward without holding things up. Well, I, I have a I have a, um, a a reluctance to issue a decision on something that we don't need to be issuing a decision on. Correct. So it's, it's so issuing a decision to so to insert a condition means we'd have to have a decision, and I don't think we need a decision because we don't need a variance. And so it's it's a hundred percent clear here that you don't think we need a variance for this. Include I'm sorry. So you, the, I'm sorry. I, it's so difficult with it being remote. I'll be very honest, just over the phone here instead of in person. So um, yeah, we, we've been doing Mr. this for Hutchins. three hours, so we certainly appreciate the challenges <laughs> sure. associated with this. So I heard sure. loud and clear. I heard loud and clear from the building inspector that based on a, a second review here at the hearing tonight, that there doesn't appear to be a need for a variance. Okay, Mr. Hutch, Mr. Hutchins, would you one one more time ensure that I've got that right? Paul, you do have that right. If if their true number is 4.5, they do not need a variance. If it's 3.8, they would have to change. Because even with the overhang, the numbers aren't right. That's only a five-inch overhang. So we, that, that, that's not correct. So uh, like I said, we'd have to know 100% where that number is now. Actually, no, I think that the, if I'm doing the math correct, 4.5 would be so to get to four would be six inches and then 0.8 out of 10 out of 12. Is that correct? That would be six, I think six plus three. So we're talking a, a nine inch overhang. Yeah. 4.5 to 3.8 in terms per feet instead of inches. So I believe that is exactly the overhang, the nine inch. Is it that anywhere on any plan that it says a nine inch overhang just to verify it? It's on the I, building plan. That's correct. Right. Yeah. It says nine inches somewhere. Where? Yeah. It says it on sheet A101. If you look in the vicinity of the kitchen, the sort of dotted line that wraps around the, the edge of the building structure, there's a note nine inch overhang. I'm sorry, at 101? A101, the floor plan. If you go up the left side about six inches, you'll see it right there. Yeah. It says nine inch overhang. There's a little half circle. Nice. 
I see it. Thank, thank you both for directing me. I'm one of those visual people. I need to see it as well. <laughs> <laughs> if you see the kitchen, if you on the left side of the kitchen, go outside the kitchen wall there. You'll kind of see it right there. It's a dotted yes. line that runs the whole way. Just behind kind of where the cooktop is shown. Mm -hmm. Do you see it now? Yep. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we oh. both see it. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so as far as um, procedure at this point, if we're, you know, essentially saying we don't need a variance, um, how do we how do we move forward as we you know we went through the approval it was officially denied told us to go to the zoning board for the variance on the side setback and now how does how does this work that, that's what that's what i was kind of getting at earlier um to mr hutchins paul is there a way to undo this on your end i think my suggestion would be that we put this over for a for a month um, then you do it assuming that there isn't a mandatory or a retractatory or whatever the, the movement is that you would need to do, Paul. Um, and once you complete that, then the applicant could withdraw the application. But in, uh, you know, until such time as you actually are in a position to un undo the denial, I guess, uh, then we could leave this on so the applicant wouldn't have to uh, you know, reapply and re-notice. I agree. Yep, that's, that would be the process to do if it's, everything's correct. Okay, so just, just just to be clear, Paul, we 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 are clear that you have you have the uh, look. I'm 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 doing the the baby steps here. I think I know the answer. I just want to put the put everybody on the same page. Yes, please. you as the building inspector have the authority to uh, undo a denial that you've issued. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Brilliant. Okay. My, my, my suggestion, Joyce, is that um, you know we continue this to the next meeting, July 14th. My expectation is that you and Paul are going to work together to undo the denial. Once the denial is undone and you're clear on that, then kindly withdraw the application. Okay. I'm sorry. I, I'm, I think my, my brain is getting a little tired here. Can, I'm, can you repeat that one more time just so I hear it clearly? So We're going to put this over for a month. Okay. In the which in, means in the, the July time, 14th, starting tomorrow. Okay. Starting tomorrow, you and you and Mr. Hutchins can work together to undo the denial. Okay. Assuming the denial is undone, you no longer need a variance application, and so therefore kindly withdraw this so that you don't have to report on July 14th. Okay. Kindly withdraw. Okay. And then um, one one question while I have just to make sure all of our I's are dotted and T's are crossed in 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 dealing with this more directly and not having to come back through the variance process. Um, would the statement be that as far I, I'm thinking I can I can squeeze in the edge of that overhang um, so that it it respects the 4.3 foot um, clearance from that side setback versus versus uh, seeing the the land surveyor's notation here of the 3.8 is that going to cause a flag um, to pull us back into the variance process do you understand um, my question i think I, the question the, i don't know what your question was but oh, i know what i, I heard I, 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 what, I, what I heard what i heard is um, hey, hey, Mr. Chair, shall I shall I pull the overhang back nine inches? And if that's the question, then my answer is I don't think that's relevant. Actually, I don't think the the overhang is not an issue. Does the overhang? I guess that's that's the critical question I'm trying to ask. Maybe is is the overhang counted within that setback requirement? No, it isn't. Okay, so it's to, it's to the face of the it's face of the, foundation. Yes, exactly. Okay, so then, like you said, we're growing. We're actually we're pulling a little further away. We're going from 4.3 out to 4.5 as we as we pull towards the back of the property. So we right. can maintain yeah. everything, everything as we have it, and simply um, uh, work with Mr. Hutchins to to deal with the reversal of the initial decision to have to go through the variance. Yes, you just have to remove that okay. 3.8 that looks like it's going to the foundation. 
Yes, I can see that 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 would confuse anyone, but so, I I do believe that yep. that that's just simply the overhang. So as long mm -hmm. as the four point three and the four point five showing it growing as we go back, then we should be okay. You are okay. It's okay. Not, it's not a question at that point. Okay. Okay. Um, well, this was a, 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 <laughs> a then we're dotting i's and cross we're dotting i's and crossing t's. Is there a motion to continue to July fourteenth? So moved. Mo moved by Ms. McIntyre. Is there a second? There's a second, Ron Fagan. Thank you, Mr. Fagan. Motion made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Yeah, we're going to go with the unanimous on that one. So we are continued to July 14th. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. The last item on the agenda is, or not the, not the last item, the next item on the agenda is that there is a new variance application form that the, the team at Town Hall has prepared for us. It is not something necessarily that we need to talk about tonight. I know I have not gone line by line, but I want to put it on the agenda. Uh, have everybody take a look at it. If you have other ideas, suggestions, questions, comments, concerns, let's talk about them at the next meeting, July 14th. You can certainly submit that stuff to, uh, to Jennifer as well if you've got handwritten stuff that you don't think is important enough to bring to a, a, a meeting discussion, then by all means, get, get that de minimis stuff to, to Jen. Um, any comments, questions, concerns on that? None, 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 none for me. Seeing and hearing none, we're going to move on to number eight, the addition of a July meeting date and deadlines. The reason that this is on the agenda is just so that we are upfront transparent to the world and to each other. COVID-19 has caused a little, little bit of a delay, a little bit of a backlog. July is ordinarily a month that the zoning board takes off, but we want to do our public duties kind of things here. So we are going to add a meeting on July 14th in order to tend to business so that we don't unnecessarily um, stop folks. It is everybody's, it's, well, it's my hope anyway, that we are live and in person in July. Um, um, if some people are going to be uncomfortable with that, then perhaps there will be, uh, you know, a way for a half measure to, to call in. All of that is entirely up in the air, not up for necessarily conversation right now, because we can go down a rabbit hole and talk for hours about the possibilities or impossibilities. So suffice it to say that July 14th, please put it on your calendars. Paul, well, is, um, there, is there anything right now uh, on the docket yet? Yes. Okay. So at, at a minimum, the two hearings from earlier that got continued, the, the Linden Street, I think it is, those are certainly going to be on the calendar. Okay. Uh, Paul? Yes, sir. Um, uh, 505. Um, wow. 505. I can't even remember the name of the street. That's how late it's getting. It's getting late. I've been up since 6 in here, so I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> The uh, the big project uh, Sutton Street. Sutton oh, Street. Sutton Thank Street. you much. That's why we have Jen. Um, five oh five is going to be on the should be on July. Okay. That's thank, the thank you. Thank you for yeah. that update. Sure. All right. Uh, any if there's nothing else from the board, then we should probably hear a motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion to adjourn. <laughs> Motion made by Ms. McIntyre. Is there a second? I'll second it. That was that, Steve? <laughs> yes, I finally got one in. <laughs> <laughs> Motion made and seconded. We could just do a voice vote here. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? There are none. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you all. Nice job, Paul. Nice <laughs> okay. job. Thank you, guys. Right. You guys did a great job. Good night, everyone. Good night, guys. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night.